Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I'd like to talk to you about aquatic biomes. Now that, that's opposed to terrestrial, terrestrial meaning earth or land biome. Now the earth is mostly water, as you know. It's 75% water, and so it's certainly, I know we don't often consider it so much because we're living on the land ourselves, but boy, the aquatic biome is so, so huge. It's 75% of the earth. It's uh, it's massive, and we're certainly linked to it. We're linked to the fresh water, which is associated with land, but we're also linked, and either directly if we're eating fish or indirectly if we're breathing the oxygen that's coming out of the ocean. It's such it's such a huge thing. Um, I welcome you all someday to take a class specifically on marine biology, which is the study of the um, the oceans and oceanography and the marine organisms, but. This is a brief look at the aquatic biomes, both uh, marine and fresh. So I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into this conversation. If we can. So one of the things that I want to say about this is that there's to discuss the organisms, and then we'll talk a little bit about the water and the different strata in the water. But the organisms themselves can be uh, classified under three main types, and one of them is plankton. I, that's a term that I think most people have heard of before, but what it really what it means is that uh, these organisms are extremely small. Often they're microscopic, so you need a microscope to see this plankton. And one of the main characteristics of plankton is that it's carried by currents in the ocean and waves. So in other words, it is not free swimming. It's a little guy, it's getting pushed around, and it's extremely numerous. It's <laughs> like almost uncountable. We're talking about within plankton, there's photosynthetic plankton or phytoplankton, sometimes plant plankton. But it just means that it's photosynthetic. And what this means is that we're talking about bacteria. Bacteria can also photosynthesize. Cyano, blue-green bacteria are capable of taking in carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen, and producing carbohydrate. And algae. Now, algae, uh, small as it may be, but it's extremely numerous. And so I just want to emphasize right out of the gate, one of the most important concepts is that this phytoplankton is responsible for the greatest primary productivity of the Earth. In other words, it is producing the most massive amount of carbohydrate and oxygen in the entire planet because it's so numerous and the ocean is so vast Phytoplankton is literally the foundation or the base of the food pyramid, which powers really all life. And that can that could sort of translate onto the land as well. But if we were to stay in the ocean, of course, these photosynthetic little plankton are eaten by little animal-like little plankton. And so we have the something called zooplankton for animal plankton. Now, this could be protozoa, little tiny single-celled organisms, or it could even be like the larva, which is the juvenile state of even a larger organism. The larva, so these are animals, or not technically animals per se, but proto protozoa is a heterotroph, so it's eating something else, either autotrophic. So this, these are consumers, the, the zooplankton, and they're eating the photoplankton or phytoplankton. And then you can sort of predict where it's going. So if this is, if these zooplankton are eating this, then there's something eating the the uh, the zooplankton. So these are herbivores right here, the zooplankton, because they're eating the phytoplankton. Now, nectum is a word meaning like a swimmer, and so the the thing that most people consider to be nectonic is fish. <laughs> and so these are. You know, I, I say large, strong swimmers, but they don't have to necessarily be so large, but larger compared to the zooplankton, certainly. But they get progressively larger. If you can sort of picture that cartoon of the big fish eating a little fish, it's eating a little fish, and then ultimately it's eating the zooplankton and then the phytoplankton. So that could be something, could be huge, could be like a whale, for example, or a sea turtle, something like that, but a swimmer. So you get like floaters, you get swimmers, and then you have this third class of organisms, which are benthos, which are these organisms that are sort of um, on the ground. And so think of this as ground dwelling. They're, they're capable of moving, but they're mostly 
on the ground. Some are fixed to a particular spot, like, but worms and lobsters and oysters and uh, sea urchins, things that are sort of uh, stuck to a substrate on the bottom. And so we have floaters, swimmers, and bottom dwellers. And so here's a picture of some phytoplankton. I thought I'd include that just to sort of get a visualization. What I would suggest is that you you type in phytoplankton in, a, in, in your um, internet search engine and sort of look at images of all the different kinds. They're rather beautiful, I might say, but they're all capable of photosynthesis. And so I say primary productivity because it's so important. They're producing the oxygen that we have in the earth. So they're largely responsible for the 21% of oxygen we have in the atmosphere. I don't want to disregard the great boreal forests and the tropical rainforest, but ba basically this is where a lot of oxygen is coming from, the ocean. And it's also a great sink for carbon dioxide as well. And so I like this picture. If you watch the video on the terrestrial biome, it's sort of the same thing. We're, we could take a look. Let me start down here at the different regions of the ocean. So now we're talking about characteristics of the ocean itself, not the organisms. So down here, do you see this dark blue abyssal zone? So what this is are these extremely deep caverns in, in the bottom of the ocean. They're like these huge trenches, the abyssal zone. And then we have the ocean pelagic, which is just out here all the, the light blue color. Now the, in other words, the open ocean. And then we have coral reefs. Coral reefs, if you notice, are sort of lavender here. They're hugging along the coast. Do you notice here, right here, and right here? And so the characteristic of coral reef is that it's present on the continental shelf in the neuritic zone. And so here you have coral uh, organisms that are, that are living and all kinds of fish. It's just, I'll, I'll mention a little bit later in the video, but it's the, the greatest source of biodiversity in the ocean is on the coral reef. And so it's one of those hot zones it's sort of like the ocean's tropical rainforest. Tremendous biodiversity needs to be protected. It's most vulnerable because, again, when, when it's so close to the continent on the shelf, that means that people, humans, have a chance to interact with it, and that's not so good for the coral reef. Then we have intertidal zones. When, again, the intertidal zone is, of course, next to the land, and that's where the water meets the land, and there's high tide and low tide. We'll talk about it. Estuary is kind of cool. If you're familiar with the San Francisco Bay, that's an estuary, which is sort of a mixture of, of marine, which is 3% uh, salt, and fresh water. So it's kind of an in-between, and it'll vary. But estuary is a combination of fresh and salt water. Uh, rivers, of course, uh, are fresh water, and those are associated with the land because when water in the water cycle evaporates, it leaves behind the salt and it rains down fresh water. So in other words, no salt is raining down. So some of the large lakes we might be familiar with in the United States are the Great Lakes up here and uh, Lake Victoria and, and Africa, which is really huge. But look at this. Look at these rivers here. This is the Great Mississippi. This is the amazing Amazon River, which bisects South America. This is, of course, the Nile over here. So these rivers are, are really important. Uh, they're sources of water, sources uh, of water for humans, but also for agriculture and for many organisms. And of course, lakes are reservoirs. They're like a sink, uh, a basin, which collects the water. And so humans really rely on, <laughs> this is an obvious statement, uh, as well as all the other land animals on uh, fresh water. And so it's very precious because it's, it's a very small percentage of the world's water, which is mainly salty water. So the, the marine, as I was mentioning, uh, has a salt concentration of about 3%, and that's 75%, give or take, of the Earth's surface, so it totally dominates. There may be a time in the future it's capable, we're capable of doing it now, but it's just not cost efficient. But we'll, we'll be able to use reverse osmosis and sort of push the salt out of the water in order to create uh, and generate fresh water. That might be something we can look forward to in the future. But fresh water is precious and it's characterized by having low salt and of course it's linked to the land because the water is coming over from the ocean and raining down and there's also uh, underground water as well. So wanted to talk 
uh, to you about when you consider water biomes, a lot of the conversation comes from looking at a profile. And so this is sort of a side view that you're looking at of, of, a, of a water environment. And what we like to do is sort of create layers or strata. So why do we do that? Why do we name these different regions? It's, it's, a, it's for, for clarity of conversation. Because if you're specializing in, as a marine biologist, you'll really, these terms are extremely useful. If you're just hearing them for the first time, like anything, it's like you're hearing a your name for the first time. It sort of comes in, goes out. But I just pr present them to you, either uh, here nor there. So a lot of the phytoplankton, as one might imagine, is sitting up here toward the top of the water because it's incumbent upon the sun for photosynthesis. And of course, the zooplankton will follow the phytoplankton. And so zooplankton's eating the phytoplankton, and then the big fish and then the next fish, next fish. So you have the food chain going on in the water. And then when things die, they settle, of course, to the bottom. Now, what's fascinating is the nutrients that fall down to the bottom of the ocean, it'd be great if there was some nutrient up here at the top, don't you think? Because phytoplankton need nitrogen and they need phosphorus. And so, and so in order to generate a lot of phytoplankton, you need nutrients. So if it was all falling down, it'd be not so good. So as it turns out, there's physical phenomena that will take the cold water, which is way deep, and, uh, and it'll bring it up. It's called upwelling. And so cold water comes up. Now, why is cold water coming up? It's rather complicated. Again, you could look that up. But it has something to do with the fact that the wind is blowing the surface water, and it has to do with current. But sort of take it on faith that the water is upwelling and when that cold nutrient rich water comes up it comes up to this upper region which is the photic zone this is the region of, the, of I mentioned strata it's the region of the water which light is capable of penetrating and so this is where photosynthesis is occurring and if this is where photosynthesis is occurring this is where the vast majority of life is in the photic zone in the water and so I wanted to point out something kind of local you might be familiar with Monterey Bay, and this is Santa Cruz over here. Um, what's interesting about this is this is a, a look at what's under the water. Look how deep it can get. This is a deep trench outside of Monterey. And so Monterey is famous for its great fishery. In other words, you can fishermen come out here on the boats and they're catching all kinds of fish. It's really abundant. Why is that? It, it has to do with the fact that the, these big trenches are out here and the cold water that has all that nutrient is upwelling. And so what's happening is, again, the, whoops, the, the current is bringing up upwelling, bringing up the nutrients to the, to the photic zone, and then the phytoplankton is really consuming that. It's flourishing. That means that there's a lot more zooplankton, more little fish, bigger fish, bigger fish. And so it's able to support many trophic levels. And so you get all kinds of marine mammals that are thriving in Monterey Bay, and you get a, a, this huge kelp forest that's also thriving here. And so it's really cool. Uh, a lot of primary productivity happens in Monterey Bay. Thus, there's a lot more trophic levels that can be supported. And it all kind of comes from the physicality of up upwelling. I find that to be kind of interesting. So again, these zones, don't, don't get too uh, thrown off by them. They're not too tricky. And I, I think maybe you've even may be familiar with them. But the intertidal zone, I think most people are familiar with that because we're living on the land and we've been down to the tide pools before. And the intertidal zone is where the water meets the land and it comes high tide, low tide, so it cycles. We, we say that there's tide pools because sometimes there's little basins in the rock and the water will actually remain and there's, there's invertebrates that can live in there. It's pretty pretty awesome intertidal zone. The neuritic zone is the continental shelf, so it's fairly shallow. I say shallow, not, not that you could stand in it per se, but it, but it's more shallow than the open ocean. And so you have something called the ocean, the ocean <laughs> zone, which extends past the neuritic zone. It goes out and it can be very deep. And then there's the pelagic zone, which is just merely the open ocean. And then the benthic zone is the seafloor. I think it's pretty clear when you see it on this sort of side profile here. Here's the intertidal zone, so high tide, low tide, like this. The neuritic zone is the continental shelf. This is where the coral reef would be found. Here's the open ocean out 
as you extend. Here's the photic zone. Notice how, how shallow that is compared to the aphotic zone, which is in dark. So it's kind of scary if you ask me that this is in total darkness, <laughs> the majority of the ocean. And so you get these other regions out here, which is the pelagic zone. Again, this is the open o ocean right in here. And then the benthic area is where all the organisms that are um, adhering to the ground are living. And then deep, deep down, if you had a big trench down here, it would be the abyssal zone. And then there's even some volcanoes. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, there's deep sea vents that, that extrude uh, lava that comes out and it creates these little mountains. And hot, 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 scalding hot water can come out. And surprisingly, for many, many decades, uh, biologists believe that there's no life down on the very bottom of the ocean because how could it be? Life is powered by the photic zone, and how can anything sustain itself down here? But as it turns out that these deep sea vents can generate a lot of nutrient, and it's rather warm water, and there are some strange communities that are subsiding down there, and they're not, they're not being powered by light, but they're being powered by uh, chemoautotrophs. So they're using uh, chemical energy instead of the, ener the light from the sun. That's kind of, kind of interesting. Let me show you. What I'm talking about in the bottom of the ocean. I don't know if you've seen this before, but check this out. These are these deep sea vents that are just pouring out like high sulfur content boiling water. It's pretty pretty wild. We have submarines that can go down there, and there's really odd looking organisms. There's these big sea red sea worms that are down there. There's some albino crabs and all kinds of weird weirdness. <laughs> That's happening down there. I say weird. It's it's not really weird. It's it's weird to us because we're unfamiliar with it. But there might be a time in the future where uh, our ability to get down to the bottom of the ocean will be a little bit easier, and so it would be maybe more common. Well, we certainly don't know a lot about this abyssal zone and and these benthic organisms that live live deep down. But they're adapted to this. Obviously, it's cold down there and it's dark down there, and there are these deep sea thermal vents that I was showing you um, that are found down there and some tube worms. So the ocean pelagic is most of the ocean. It's like the majority of the, the bulk of the ocean. So it's it's deep water and it's 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 being mixed by the current. Um, it it's where you might find one of these giant humpback whales cruising around. It, it has a lot of free swimming uh, uh, fish and mammals cruising around. And then again the bentos down here is the bottom dwelling ones, and you can have, they can be living in the neuritic or uh, the pelagic zone. Um, and again, there's a lot of productivity down here because there's nutrient on the bottom. That's where things are sort of falling down, and so you get a lot of bacteria decomposition and a lot of invertebrates like to live there. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, an area that you might be uh, familiar with if you live around the Bay Area in California, which is the wetlands. Now what's, uh, what's fascinating is when the water meets the land, there's sort of this buffer region called wetlands. And what happens is the water can sort of mingle with the, with the soil and it creates kind of a spongy-like environment. And it's, it's marshy. And what's fascinating is that it's, it's a great habitat for worms and all kinds of little like clams and mussels and things like this, which attracts an insects, which attracts a lot of bird life. And so birds like to come to the wetlands either to stay or to stop temporarily to eat if they're migrating. And so it's a great habitat. However, unfortunately, the wetlands are rapidly disappearing because the fact that it's close to the ocean or close to water means that it's a desirable place to, to put development. And so uh, developers like to build houses and condominiums and whatever next to the water because it's, it's highly sought after. And so these wetlands are really important because they're, they're, again, they're, they're an area with a lot of biodiversity. And they're kind of critical because they sort of prevent major flooding. So if you remove and put development, on, or, or, or pour a lot of sand onto the, onto the wetland, you're like, wow, I'm going to live in a house right next to the, the ocean. It would be great, um, right next to the bay. But it, in fact, without that buffer, uh, there's a, there might be a tendency to be flooded, <laughs> as, it, as it turns out. So 
An estuary is in a region like, for example, in San Francisco Bay, where lakes, let me sort of illustrate this if I can, lakes are entering in here like this. So lakes are, are contributing to fresh water. And then the ocean is bringing in salty water. So in the where it's mingling is an estuary. It's where, where the fresh water and the salt water meet. And so the salinity can, can really vary. If you're talking about right next to the ocean, it's around 3%. And over here, it might be 1% in the middle. So it's like 1%, 2%, and then 3% over here, per se. If I'm able to write that. And so it's, it's fascinating. Uh, and it'll also de depend on the on the depth of the water and things like this. And so an estuary is, is kind of a neat environment. And here's a here's sort of a satellite picture of this. Um, you're familiar with the fact that these rivers are entering in here and they're here in the Napa ri River, the American River, Sacramento River, like this. And so this whole area is an estuary down in here. And so right here, it's pretty salty, and then up here, not as much. What's interesting is that it gets shallow down below here. And so you can control it. There's areas right over here where you can sort of cut off. I don't know if you're familiar with this. If you've flown into San Francisco Airport, which is right here in South San Francisco, there's areas where you can cut off from the, from the bay and make it really shallow. And what can happen is the water will evaporate, evaporate, because it's warm down here and it'll get really, really, really salty. And as it gets really, really, really salty, not a lot of organisms can survive there except for salt-tolerant bacteria. And so you get these like square regions with all these different colors because of the bacteria that's growing there. And eventually that dies, and then what happens is you have salt. <laughs> and so this is a good way to, to generate salt because we, like we like to consume that. So the, in, the intertidal zone is really neat. Again, it's where the water comes up onto the land, and it's really characterized as being um, like there's clear layers. Uh, like it could be rocky, could be sandy, but it's uh, distributional limitations. In other words, some organisms are more tolerant to living out of water. <laughs> for a prolonged period of time. There's some organisms that really don't prefer that, so they need to live lower down. If you were to put layers like this, you can say that you know, these guys are really taking a chance up here because the water will only come up during high tide and it'll come down here for low tide. And so there's a real distribution here. So what's fascinating is the tide pool, when I think of tide pools or the intertidal zone, I think you know not only are they areas, again, where they're close to people, so they're, um, they could be destroyed. But I think they're great places for ecological study, because you can come over here and stand next to a tide pool and basically study competition between the organisms. You could look at predation between the organisms. You could look at species diversity. You could study all sorts of interactions, because these organisms don't really move around so quickly and you don't have to manipulate them as much. You could just sort of observe what's happening ecologically. And so there, we've learned so much ecology from the tide pools. It's, it's quite amazing. And up in um, Bodega Bay, there's a marine biology lab there that's run by the University of California. This is a beautiful picture down the peninsula at Moss Beach, another beautiful place to study tide pools. This is the water comes in in high tide and then it's able to stay in here for a while. And so there's many types of benthic organisms that will live in here. And sometimes even fish are caught up in there. And in the coral reef, the coral reef, again, is so important to us because it's so diverse in terms of its biodiversity. And unfortunately, it's in danger because um, uh, I won't go, go into it so much in this particular video, but uh, we're having it concerns about coral reef because the ocean is becoming a little bit more acid than it, than it used to be. And that, that has to do with the increase of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is permeating into the water. And the carbon dioxide is interfering with the coral reef's ability to grow. And so that's kind of a, a, a worry moment. And so the coral reef is such a spectacular thing. Let me, let me show you um, just a little. If you're unfamiliar with the coral reef, I have just a little quick 
something to show you. It's, it's such a beautiful place, and um, there's great diversity. Here's like a sunken ship, and what's interesting is you might think of a ship as being like pollution, but in fact, it's a great place for new organisms to grow. It's, a, it's sort of like a clean substrate. And so you get these uh, marine organisms that, that can take uh, calcium out of the water and build their little homes. They live in, a, in association with, with uh, photosynthetic bacteria, which provide them nutrient. And then um, that just supports an, a, a tremendous amount of diversity and many different types of species can live there. And so it's such a, such a beautiful place. Um, it's one of those places where it's, it's a little scary because it's one of those places where you could love it to death. And so that's kind of a concern. Um, when you turn your attention to fresh water, if you look at a lake instead of the ocean, you get some similar aspects in fresh water as well. You have like a shallow area right in here, and it's called the littoral zone or littoral zone right in here, and then the limnitic zone is sort of the out, outer part of a lake, and then it still has the photic zone and the aphotic zone and the benthic zone. So a lake can be rather vast. If you think of the Great Lake, it's almost like you're living on the ocean or, or Lake Tahoe in California. It's sort of massive. And again, it's real cold on the bottom, four degrees. Uh, here's the photic zone. This is where the algae phytoplankton is living up here. And so you get the same sort of phenomena happening. You get the photic zone, the aphotic zone. Toral zone will allow plants to actually come up. These are cattails that are stuck to the bottom here and that are growing up. So there's a lot of life along the edge. And then the aphotic zone, uh, no light is penetrating. And so on the bottom, uh, you, you get a lot of nutrient because when organisms die, they, the nutrient sinks to the bottom and so decaying uh, organic matter is called detritus. So you get a lot of detritus on the bottom in the benthic zone. As it turns out, you can classify lakes based on how much nutrient is in the lake. And so there's something called an oligotrophic lake. Oligo is a prefix that means few. So few nutrients. So it's nutrient poor. Uh, it's, it's often cold. And as a result of it being nutrient poor, there's not a lot of phytoplankton, therefore not a lot of zooplankton, not a lot of fish. And so it, the, the water tends to be very clear, and there's not much life in these lakes. They're oligotrophic. They're rather beautiful. Like, wow, look at that beautiful blue high Sierra lake. And an example of that is something called May Lake in Yosemite. It's a really beautiful lake. It's oligotrophic, and so it's really clear. And so we're going to actually visit May Lake on a field trip someday. And so uh, a eutrophic lake is one in which that it's a little bit more shallow and it's high in nutrient. And so if it's high in nutrient, that means there's going to be a lot of algae production. And as it turns out, algae production isn't always what you want. If there's too much algae, if there's too much nutrient in the water, too, too much nutrient runoff, and it's like, well, some lakes just have a lot of nutrient just because of the soil, but sometimes, if I may go off on this point a little bit, we like to say that this is a lake, and we like to, humans like to farm next to lakes. Why do we do that? Because it's a, it's a source of water for irrigation. And then what else do we do? We like to add lots of, of fertilizer right here. In other words, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium to the soil so that our crops will grow. But then when it rains, these nutrients roll off and they go into the lake, and so they really increase the nutrient level in the lake. Uh, this can be really harmful because the algae will start to grow, and it'll excessively grow, called a bloom. So it's really, 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 really growing. And then, as it, of course, the algae is going to die. And when the algae dies, all of that dead detritus on the bottom of the lake gets to be so out of control that the bacteria begin to decompose it. And so there is a bacteria increase, a massive bacterial increase. And so therefore, bacteria actually consume a lot of the dissolved oxygen in the lake. And as it turns out, the, the amount of dissolved oxygen in a 
eutrophic lake will be decreased. Now, you're like, yeah, whatever. But without oxygen, then the fish are not going to do well. And it starts a, it starts a sort of a, a, a vortex of trouble because without that, then the fish are dying and then there's more decomposition, et cetera, et cetera, and sort of builds upon itself. And so this process is called eutrophification. It's sort of like humanity's uh, increase in nutrients into a fresh water source, and it can be very harmful. And, you know, sometimes we don't know what we're doing. Sometimes This is, of course, not deliberate. No one's trying to do this on purpose. But it just happens that because of our normal activity, like, for example, if this is a river, okay, no longer a lake, so this is a river, and over here, next to the river, there's a forest. Okay, And so we're like, hey, these trees, maybe I would like to cut some of them down. And so when we, were, when we cut these down and we remove these trees, and then it starts to rain, the nutrient, again, runs off into the river, runs off into the river. And so deforestation can cause a lot of mudslides, and the nutrient goes into the water, and then that increases the, the nutrients. And again, it sets into place eutrophification. This is a real serious problem. If the, ri the rivers become polluted, and then, uh, then the fish and all the other organisms that are, that are living there um, are in jeopardy. And, it, and we don't want to pollute our rivers because our rivers, again, are the source of our drinking water if you want to bring it close to home. And so this is, this is a consideration. And so you can move from sort of there's this middle ground, too, called meso mesotrophic or mesotrophic. You can go from oligotrophic to mesotrophic and then eutrophic. And so oftentimes, as I was mentioning, sadly, pollution from fertilizer can cause excessive algae population and then decrease um, oxygen content. And unfortunately, a, a prime example of this is one of our greatest lakes in the state of California is called Clear Lake. How ironic is this? That the lake is literally called Clear Lake, but indeed it is not clear. It, it's rather green, and people always like comment about that. You're like, "Well, this great, this lake is green. What the, you know, what's going on with that?" And it smells. It's like, ah, oh, it's like, what, what's happening? And it, and it's really to do with the fact that it's, it's, it's a shallow lake, and there's a tremendous amount of nutrient runoff, uh, naturally, nutri the, but also through agriculture. So it's, it's kind of sad. And again, streams and rivers are water that's in motion. Usually there's a source high up in the mountain. Like, for example, if it's snowing, that could be the source of where the, where the river's coming. And it comes down, usually by gravity, in one direction. And it, it could em empty into the ocean. And where, the ocean, where it sort of fans out and it, uh, is called the delta. And then eventually it'll enter into the, like, for example, the estuary and then the ocean. So it's in one direction, a river. <laughs> um, there could be headwaters as well. And so um, it's often at the, at the headwater, which is the source. It's often cold, and it's off, uh, often very clean, and it's often nutrient poor. It picks up nutrients as it moves along and along. And it also, as you can see here, as it rolls over the rocks, it, it gets aerated. And so there's like high oxygen content in these rivers, especially close to the headwater, because cold water holds more oxygen. There's less nutrient, and so it's just a, a great source. And so um, we could study uh, one of these great rivers of, uh, in California, which is the Tuolumne River. We could look at some of the abiotic factors. We could look at dissolved oxygen. We could look at the pH. We could look at the nitrogen and phosphorus levels. And you might be thinking, you know, how can there's probably nothing wrong with the with a lake, uh, I'm sorry, a river in a national park because it's protected, but you'd be surprised because sometimes some pollution from industry along the coast of California will blow in an easterly direction, and then that will bounce off the granite walls of the west slope of the Sierra Nevada, and then it'll actually run off into these rivers. And so these rivers need to be maintained, and these rivers need to be checked. And so one way to check the quality of the river is to look at if how's the life doing. In other words, are there, you know, how the fish doing? Or if you were to pick up rocks on the bottom of the river, there's on the bottom of the rock, you might be surprised, there's lots of larvae. They're called macroinvertebrates. 
I know that it's, it's kind of ironic because they're very tiny. But these little guys are what fish are eating, like the larva, like mayflies or, or stoneflies or mosquito larva or beetle larva. These things are living there, and if you were to pick up a rock and rub your hands on it, and you can catch it in a net, and you can sort of measure the abundance of these organisms, and that's an indirect measure of the health of the, of the river. and see how it's doing. It's kind of cool. So I hope you enjoyed a, a, a brief, believe it or not, a brief look at aquatic biomes on the earth. Thanks for watching.